All right. So homework for today uh, was uh, write a function called print reverse that takes a string as a parameter and displays to the screen the contents of that string in reverse order. So we started looking at string functions and uh, uh, last time. So this is again trying to put together some of the abilities that we've learned in here. So uh, we saw last time that strings are zero index. So if a string has a length of five, the legal buckets of that string are zero to four. And if you're going to print out that string in reverse, you have to visit bucket four, then bucket three, then bucket two, then bucket one, then bucket zero. Well, you can use a loop that takes I on a voyage between four, three, two, one, zero, and then use that value to display the current value in the string. Okay, so we're we're taking some of those fundamental uh, abilities that we have and uh, putting them together again to solve a problem in the context of a function that we can call multiple times. All right, so let's go and look at this dude. We just have it in this 200 scratch pad, I think. I feel like we maybe created something specifically for strings. That's 300. Oh, here, I gave you some starter code. Let's just look at what this looks like and I'll be able to identify the right file. So it's not letting me change it, but that's okay. I'll just steal this. Maybe I didn't save it under mine. So I'll just create a new project and bring that code in. Spring starter. Okay, so we looked at this last time where we created a string. String lives inside of our standard namespace. So we created a string named S. Strings look like this. So double quote followed by some stuff followed by a double quote. Um, I think I probably mentioned last time that uh, in C++ we have some various vintages of strings. So we have an old style string, which is actually something called a char pointer, where if you ever have something that looks just like that, the default way that C++ interprets that is, you must be an old style string. So if you're using something just like that, it's not going to necessarily be a fan of you using some uh, of the newer uh, abilities on it, unless you convince it convince C++ that, hey, this guy is actually one of our new style strings. And we'll explore that a little bit uh, uh, today. But uh, for right now, you didn't need any of the special stuff for your homework. So in any case, here's a string equal to hello world. In this example, we saw that we can get the length of our string by calling s.length. I think some people saw that there's a function called s.size as well. If I come into here and I do C++ string um, functions, yeah, here's a bunch of functions associated with strings. So we'll look at a couple of these uh, uh, today. Okay, but notice down here we have one that's called the size, returns the length of the string. We have something called length, returns the length of the string. Both those do do the same thing. I'm inclined to use length because a lot of other languages use that for strings. Um, 
but other languages do use size for like the size of various collections and stuff. So that's why they probably both uh, um, exist. Okay. So in any case, so this guy is going through every element in our string, starting at, so this for loop takes I on a voyage between zero and the length of our string, not including the length of that string. So it's less than, so if my length was five, for example, this would go from zero to one to two to three to four. Four would be the last time through. What am I doing to change I each time? I'm adding one to it. So that's what this for loop does. That's all that for loop says it does is it takes I through all the values between zero and S dot length minus one. How am I using that value of I here? Well, I'm going to print out the string at the index I in here, which should print out the collection of characters inside of Hello World in forward order. All right, so this isn't quite what we wanted with our homework because we actually wanted to print it out in reverse. So to print it out in reverse, we have to start off at the, and then we needed to write a function to do this. So I'll go ahead and write my function down here. So it's going to be void. Why is this not showing up? There we go. Print reverse takes in a string as a parameter. Now we don't know what the contents of that string is. We just know that it is a string. And strings have the ability to report to us what their length is. So we know that the last legal element of that string is s dot length minus one. So we're writing functions in a generic way where we don't necessarily know what this value is other than we know it's a string. So we're going to write a loop for int i is equal to, and we want to start at the very end of our string here. So the very first element that we're going to be working with is the last legal position in our string, which is bucket s dot length minus one. So that's the length of our string. Minus one is the last legal place, the last the position of the last character in our string. We want to keep going as long as i is greater than or equal to zero. We're going to walk from the end towards the beginning. And what are we going to do to i each time? We're going to subtract one from it. All right. This loop is our way of accomplishing repetition. So we've set up our loop to take i through the correct sequence of numbers. Now we're going to actually use those numbers to do something. And what are we going to do? We're going to output the string at position i where I changes each time through this loop. And actually, I, I don't need to kick it down a line if I don't want. I'll kick it down a line at the very end. This way it shows all the characters all on one line in reverse. Then I'm pressing enter at the end. Okay. I'll go ahead and get rid of that code in there. And remember, we need to prototype our function since I'm going to call it from within main and I've defined it after main. We need to make sure we prototype our functions at the top. Now, what will the output of this program be right now? Nothing. Nothing. Why? I wrote this ability down here that I can pass any string to, and it will display that string in reverse. I've created an ability, but all programs begin and end with main. And right now, what does main say to do? I define a variable. That's it. I create a variable named s. I'm remembering the string hello world inside of a variable named s, and then I'm saying I'm done. That's all I'm doing inside of me. 
So even though I've written quite a bit of code here, my program doesn't say to use any of it. But now I can go ahead and call print reverse, passing it S, and this will display hello world in reverse. So there's our hello world in reverse. Why? Because I created a variable named S, stored hello world into it. Then I called upon my ability down here that knows how to take a string and display the contents of that string in reverse. So this guy expects me to send it a string. So I did give it a string. So it displayed hello world in reverse, and then this function ended. Now, because this is an ability, I can call that ability a second time. And I can pass it another string like elephant. All right, now remember a few minutes ago, I mentioned that whenever I have something like that, C++ automatically assumes it's an old style string, not one of our newer, friendlier strings. But since this guy is expecting a newer, friendlier string to come in as a parameter, it'll go ahead and convert it for us. We don't have to do anything special. All right, but I'll show you some examples of where we would have to do something special, and then I'll show you kind of our easier workaround. You could define it as a string. Yeah. yeah. So he's saying, could I could I have created just a second string here? Yeah. String S2 is equal to elephant. Or, uh, or print reverse and then, and then put it in there. Well, that's what I did right here. Oh, yeah. yeah, but you, so you would, yeah. So, I mean, I could do that. Oh, okay. yeah. But the reason I did it this other way is just to be able to make that point that you can use string literals. That's what a literal is. A literal is a hard coded value. Okay, fancy way of saying hard coded value. Like the number five is an int literal. The character C is a char literal. This is the string literal elephant. Okay, we can use those literals, but C, and really any programming language, needs to be aware of the kind of value, the type of value that that literal is. Because all these languages are strongly typed languages. So the type of a value is important. All right. I'm just saying because C++ is so old, that literal type was already spoken for. The double quote, some sequence of characters double quote is already spoken for and is treated as this old style um, string literal, which is actually done as a character array. And we'll talk about arrays soon enough and I'll, I'll kind of bring it back to this. But right now we wanna work with these newer style friendlier strings where this guy since it was already spoken for um some languages so for instance there's a language called objective c objective c let's call that the uh competitor to c plus plus and in objective c just like um uh in c plus plus here there was an older style string which looks just like this and in Objective C, to use their newer style string, we could put a little ampersand in front of that, or the at symbol rather in front of that. And that then says, oh, by the way, this is the newer style string. Um, there actually is a symbol like this if you're using uh, Microsoft's uh, Visual Studio. So depending on your compiler, there might be some ways of advertising your string literal as being of a newer type, you know, because like I said, the dude who is double quote followed by some characters double quote that type is already spoken for in this language because it was created back in 1968 and back then they said hey we have old style strings just deal with it because it wasn't so old back then it was just that's what strings looked like okay but in this case i can pass a string literal into this since i'm expecting a new style string c++ will go ahead and convert it for me so there's nothing wrong with doing this. And there's my elephant in reverse. So notice here, I wrote my ability once. Print reverse, that is just logic that takes a string and whatever that string is, it displays it in reverse. 
And now I'm calling upon that ability two separate times. The first time I'm passing it, hello world. The second time I'm passing it, elephant. And you'll see here if I pass it a third time and I pass it S2 this time, I'm actually calling it with elephant again. There really is no difference between those two lines other than the fact that I used a little bit of memory to remember elephant there. Because ultimately variables resolve to their value and S2 here will resolve to the string elephant. So now it'll do it a second time. Go ahead. Um, so I was having issues um, actually printing uh, you know, as I, like as bracket I. But I, I think it's because I think it's because I didn't build it. Does that mean? Well, so what did you put up here? I just had print reverse string I letters. Oh yeah, a, a function has to have a return type. The a function is a reusable chunk of code that you write once and can call zero more times. But any way you cut it, when you define a function, part of the syntax of a function is the return type of that function. So if you intend to not return anything, which we are not doing in here, so kind of driving that point home that there is a difference between displaying stuff to the screen and returning the value back out for somebody else to use someplace else. If I'm returning nothing, then I would advertise that I'm returning nothing. I'm returning void. Don't expect me to return a value. If I was returning something like a string, I would put a different type on there for what I'm going to return. But in this case, I am displaying a string to the screen. I'm not actually returning a string. So you probably would have gotten, actually, I probably need to. Well, I'll get the same error, but I didn't fix it up there. Um, well, here, let me fix it here. So first of all, it's complaining print reverse was not uh, uh, written in the sco scope. C++ forbids declaration of print reverse with no type. Functions have to be defined with a return type. So you're making a promise. This is what my function will do. And then you have to fulfill that promise. If you say you're going to return something, return it. If you say you're not, make sure you tell them you're not with a void and then don't return something. Go ahead. Well, would that have fulfilled the write a function called print reverse aspect of the assignment? Probably. Prob yeah, pro pro probably not. Well, I think I copied this in the Blackboard, didn't I? Yeah, I would be very surprised if I didn't have the phrase write a function. You know, so I mean, effectively what we're doing, so he's asking, well, couldn't I have just done this? Couldn't I have taken this code and just thrown that into main here and then have it operate on that string S? This will give you that same output, right? Okay, but what's the problem? The problem is, is now this code only works on this one variable. And if I want to change or I want to reverse elephant, I have to go and change it in here. I can't just call this ability multiple times, passing it different inputs. That's the point of having a function. A function is a tool that we create that we can then pass different things to do to, and it does things to, I mean, we might want to reverse strings. That might be a thing that we want to do. So now we have a single tool that I can throw a string at and it'll print that string in reverse. I only had to write that tool once. I only had to create the tool once and now I can use it as often as I want. Let's get our voice back in here. All right, so does that make some sense? All right, so functions are they're important things, but it doesn't mean that put all your logic in a function all the time. When would you maybe not put something into a function? Can we come up with a rule of thumb when you might say, hey, it makes sense to just go ahead and put the code in, in main or whatever part of your program you're in. What would be a, a situation where that would make sense? Go ahead. Yeah, you're only gonna do it once. Don't throw it into a function if you're only gonna do it once. Now you can maybe make the argument that if what you're doing is a monster, you know, 100,000 lines of code or something, just using an extreme, 
even if you're only going to do it once maybe you throw it into a function so that in the middle of your logic up here it's one line of code that says i'm doing something super special that i'm only going to do once but i threw it in a function to keep it from having a hundred thousand lines of code separating this logic from the logic that comes after it visually for the human being but generally speaking i think uh what you mentioned is, is a good rule of thumb if you're only going to do something one time you don't have to put it in a function similarly you can that same logic goes to variables if you're only going to use a value once you don't need to store it in a variable just use it right if you're going to use the number five one time pass it a five but if you want to use it multiple times we got to remember it so that we can then go and pull it out of our memory multiple times in the future as we as we continue to use it all right so if we're only going to do some logic once you don't need a function if you want to potentially call that multiple times like last class we were dealing with is with primes right we wanted to have a little tool that we can throw a number at it told us whether that was a prime number or not a prime number that was helpful for us that was a nice tool and we wanted to work on all sorts of numbers that we throw at it all right so that's something that we would write as a function and nobody says you have to have you know have to call your functions so sometimes you might have a library that's effectively what these libraries are we are using this standard library std that has a whole bunch of stuff in it now in our program here we're only using a couple of little uh, bits of stuff that's in the standard library even though it supports a whole bunch of things so that standard library has uh, let's just say there's 100 functions in there and we're using like two of them in our in our current code all right does that mean that the standard library, the person who wrote that standard library wasted their time? Or did they create a single collection of functions that might be handy for the average developer at different points in time? So now they can kind of just carry this backpack with them. You know, don't we do that? You know, those of you who have your backpacks here, do you use every little thing that's in your backpack all the time? Or do you sometimes pull out the charge cable when you need to charge your phone? You sometimes pull out the, uh, you know the power cable you got to charge your laptop you sometimes pull out your notebook if you decide you're going to take notes whatever it is you have a bunch of crap in there that you don't use all the time but you have available to you in case you need it this is the backpack all right but it's somebody else's backpack they packed it for you and they they gave it to you as opposed to here we're kind of we're we're bringing our own abilities with us all right so here would be an example of solution for homework. All right, so any questions on this guy before we go on? Go ahead. All right, so you you built the string in reverse. I built the string in reverse. Okay, got and it. When I, at, at the end of the function, I could see all the whatever it was. Okay, got it. Um, let me paste this up on uh, Slack real quick, and then let me try to recreate your problem, <laughs> and then I'll show you the fix for it. All right. Solution for reverse string homework. What homework number was that? Homework eight. Thank you. <laughs> That's the uh, apparently the number eight is the uh, sun sunglasses emoji. <laughs> homework number eight. Oh, or is that what I wrote? I wrote the. So pound sign eight is that emoji? Oh, I got gotcha. you. So that's the emoji eight with the with the closing parenthesis. We could always throw the Mr. Gonzalez. You got to show up to the get together tomorrow. I gave a little bit of a history on the. But I'll, uh, apparently, I'm going to give a little bit more 
history at the get together tomorrow at noon. If, uh, so I encourage everybody to show up to that get together. We have some pretty cool prizes, like good stuff, not not like crap candy and stuff. Well, candy later on, but we have some good prizes. <laughs> so as long as you participate in the trivia stuff and you get get a good answer early on, there's some good prizes. Um, but do I think there's some signs around uh, here that look like this guy? Yeah. Well, yeah. it has a Q. Oh, is it right behind me? Okay, yeah, this guy has a QR code on it. Do that so that Professor Locklayer can order enough food. So sign up for it and um, that stuff. But so that's noon in here tomorrow. Highly encourage you to do it. And we will see if Mr. Gonzalez will make a appearance. I'm still working on the uh, my wife to get special permission to bring him to school. That's a whole nother backstory why he's not allowed to come to school anymore. <laughs> All right. So, um, so we're going to recreate your problem. So what you were trying to do is you were trying to uh, reverse, um, build the string in reverse. So you created another string in here. Um, what, like a string answer? Okay. But, yep. Okay. And then you walked in reverse. So what did you put inside here? I actually didn't walk in reverse. I walked forward. Reverse. And built it in reverse. I built it in reverse. Gotcha. Yep. So you had four int i is equal to zero. I is less than s dot length. I is equal to i plus one. All right. Now what did you do inside here? Answer sub i. Ah. Got it. So you tried to do this answer sub i is equal to yeah so um uh, s at bucket s dot length minus one minus i uh i yeah, minus i yeah and minus one yep okay uh so yeah this was the problem you were trying to set an individual bucket of answer answers of length zero this guy has nothing in it Right. So you you said, hey, here's my string, completely nothing. And then you started trying to set individual characters in nothingness equal to something. All right. Um, I believe strings in all new languages, strings are read only anyway. So we'll, we'll test that in a second. But the way to build a string is through something called concatenation. And I want to say, didn't I at least it, uh, I mentioned it last time and then we bumped into a uh, a bug that I just referenced again, that that idea that um, if you don't treat it as a new style string, which actually this this will this will solve that problem. Um, so here, we'll just write it here. So you built up this guy here and I'm gonna actually walk it in reverse. I think that that, uh, Probably would have taken less time just to rewrite it. <laughs> there we go. So instead of printing out the individual components of our string in here, we're going to build our string in reverse. So I'm going to say answer is equal to answer concatenated with s at bucket i. Then in the end, I can display answer. So there's my three guys here. All right. So this plus sign here, because I was working with a string type, it says, oh, we are going to tack on this character on top of whatever this guy is and store the results back in this guy. Because this is the assignment operator. So I'm saying I'm going to change the value of answer. Answer is getting a new value because I'm assigning it a value. What value is it getting? What's well, going to get the value of whatever answer currently is concatenated with this character? All right. Um, and what he was trying to do is, is a common mistake. He was trying to change an individual component of a string. And let me just confirm before I say that this is uh, true. I'm going to say S2 at bucket two is equal to a. Um, Let's call it the character two, like that. So I'm I'm trying to. This is zero, one, two. I'm trying to replace this e with a two. 
all right? And then I'm gonna say C out S2. It does let me write to a string because strings are character arrays. So actually, the fix for your thing would have been, and I think I even saw this in the documentation that I brought up here. Well, yeah, but you, you can actually define a string to be of a bigger size. probably can bake it. Well, but the question is, how do you define it to be that size? Um, well, you could build up, well, no, what we're really talking about here is, is the size of the memory chunk you're associating with it. So here, I'll say it out loud, but it's not gonna make much sense right now because we're about to look into arrays and it'll make more sense when we get in, once we get into there. You would allocate memory associated with S that was big enough to hold, well, you would allocate memory associated with answer. This guy, so I'll put the word here. You would allocate some memory, how much memory? s dot length number of bytes because a character is one byte long so this would create some memory and this guy would come out as a char pointer instead of a generic pointer and we'll talk about this at some point so now answer holds a block of memory there's nothing in it but it's a block of memory with enough space to hold all the characters of s now you can change bucket zero to something, bucket one to something, bucket two to something, so on and so forth. Now, what I'm saying though, is that this line right here, a string here, because behind the scenes, strings are implemented as character arrays, and we'll talk about arrays here today, but because strings are implemented as character arrays, um, it is a, I'm essentially setting the character at position two in this character array equal to a two. Most modern languages, strings are read only. Strings are treated differently than, than other kinds of collections. You can have a collection of ints, a collection of booleans, a collection of floats. You can have a collection of chars, which sounds a lot like a string. And really, it is the, the foundation on which strings are built. But since strings are stuff like this are things that you imagine are commonly used inside of our programs. We use strings a lot inside of our programs. And because of that, most modern languages treat strings with, uh, you know, have given us some um, conveniences with strings to, to allow us to do some certain things in a more in a, an easier way. So strings are typically protected and not allowed to be treated directly as character arrays. And that then allows us to do some other things with strings. Right here, we're seeing that in C++, the string type is not necessarily protected. You are allowed to go in and change the string directly, which actually can be beneficial in certain circumstances. Let's say that you were doing a, um, in fact, let, let's look at an example here. Let's say you were writing a function um, called, uh, you know, replace. So let's say we were writing a function, void replace. Uh, actually, why don't we have it return a string since we just looked at concatenation. And this guy is gonna take in a string as a parameter, as well as, a character C1 and a character C2. Actually, let's just call it old char and new char. Our goal here is to have a string with all occurrences of old char replaced with new char. 
So for elephant, if I was trying to replace all occurrences of E with a Z, this will end up being Z, L, Z, P, H, A, N, T. Search and replace, normal search and replace. All right, makes sense what we're trying to accomplish here. So I'm gonna walk through my string one character at a time. It's kind of our standard for loop. So for int i is equal to zero. I is less than s dot length. I is equal to i plus one. At some point, I'll we'll talk about i plus plus versus plus plus i and all that stuff because I know some of you are already using it and it's fine. But there is some details about that we need to make sure we discuss. So I'll keep using this i equals i plus one, fully changing the value of it. All right. So this is our standard loop kind of a pattern we see pretty often for going through in this case a string but it's going to be very similar to going through a collection of um, arrays or something a collection of ints collection of uh, booleans whatever so each time through we're going to ask a question am i currently looking at something equal to the old character if s at bucket i is equivalent to old char. If I'm currently looking at the old character, then what do I want to do? I just want to replace that position with my new character. In the end, I'm going to return S. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things related to this, but I'll just be obvious about it for right now. Um, I actually think we can have this be void and not return anything, but still change it permanently. But roll with me for now. Don't worry about that. All right. So I'm passing in a string. I'm going through and I'm modifying that string only when a character that I'm supposed to swap with another character is showing up. So if the current character I'm looking at is equal to the old, old character, then I'll just replace it with the new character. So now if we come up here, let me go ahead and make sure I prototype this function. And I go ahead and say string S3 is equal to replace S2 with all occurrences of E replaced with A. That's kind of what I just said, right? that's a char a char type not a string okay. so this guy takes a string a char okay. and a char three inputs first one is string type second one's a char third one's a char all right so i'm calling my function passing it for three inputs this guy has promised he's going to return a string in the end he does return a string what do I do with the string that he returns? I store it inside of a variable called S3. Now I'll go ahead and display S3 to the screen. And there's my elephant with all the E's replaced with A's. I just want to test something out here real quick. I believe S2 will also now permanently be changed. It's not very interesting. So, so um, <laughs> that's actually kind of inconsistent with uh, um, this version of C++. They're allowing us to treat strings very similarly to character arrays by directly changing a value, but these guys are what's called passed by value as opposed to passed by address so changes i make to s in here are not permanent changes that are felt outside and you don't have to worry about that right now because we'll talk about that when we get into arrays but it's a true statement uh, in this case i expected that s2 my original string that i passed in here would have been permanently changed because i didn't give it a copy I actually told it where in memory it can find elephant and go and change that guy up there in memory so that when I come back out here and I try to print it again, he's been permanently modified. All right, but that was not the case, which is, is kind of interesting. All right, but the thing we're looking at here is this code right here. 
this works in C++. I'm allowed to directly change an element of my string. In a language like Java, this would be much more difficult. So here's an example where we think about a, a newer language being, um, let's say, better than an older language. Uh, it's a little bit situational. If I was writing the same thing, so let's write a, uh, uh, we'll call this guy replace two. replace two. I'll put a little comment before that. If we assume that we can't directly change a specific, I usually call them buckets, positions in a string. So if we make the assumption that I can't directly overwrite a particular position of a string if that's the rules that we're playing by okay we saw that c actually allows it i'm telling you java wouldn't so if we pretend like we're playing by that rule how would we rewrite this code to solve the same problem now that i've tied one hand behind your back go ahead So we would follow a similar pattern to what you tried to do in, in the assignment. Yep, so we're gonna create a string, maybe named answer, or you can call it reverse string if you want, whatever you wanna call it. So we're gonna create a string, and what we're gonna do is we're going to rebuild the original string. We're gonna concatenate all the characters onto the original, from the original string that we're not supposed to change. And then anytime we bump into one that we were supposed to change, will instead concatenate on a replacement. Okay, so we're going to ask a similar question. We're going to say, if the current character I'm looking at is equivalent to old char, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say answer is equal to answer concatenated with new char. Otherwise, answer is equal to answer concatenated with the character that was already there. If I'm looking at a character I should swap, go ahead and tack on to my, my string I'm in the process of building up, tack on the thing I'm swapping it with. Otherwise, if I'm not looking at the character that I wanna swap, then I do nothing to it. I just keep the old character. So I'll tack on whatever the old character is. I'm not actually changing S. I'm actually building up a new copy of S inside of a variable called answer, only replacing certain elements of it with my new chart. So when all is said and done here, I can now return answer. Answer should be mostly a copy of S with only times when we ran into old char replaced with whatever new char was. So in this case, I'm not directly changing elements of S. Instead, I'm building up a brand new string called answer, building it in the correct logical way, and then returning that new string in the end. All right, we come up here, we'll call replace two on this guy, and we'll see that it still works. So there's our elephant being passed to display two or replace two rather but i would say if you look at these two examples this code looks more convenient than this code and that's especially true because it seems like in c plus plus strings behave like they do in java in that any changes we make to a string inside of a function are not permanently felt outside that function. So we kind of get the best of, best of both worlds. It's protected on a global scale, but we are allowed to directly change elements of the string inside. This seems like a much better solution to the same problem than this. Not that this was overly difficult, but this seems less convenient. 
in our modern programming languages, Java, C sharp, we would have to do it this way because they don't allow you to change the contents of a string directly. All right. Now, that doesn't mean that one's better or worse than the other. We're learning to program here. The constraints of this language say that, hey, you can change individual elements of a string if you want. It's allowed, but that the phrase would be strings are passed by value, not by address. And we'll talk about what that means um, after we discuss arrays. All right. So either one of these is viable. This would be your mentality in most modern languages where we're we're starting off with the given information that strings are not directly modifiable. If you want to change the content of a string, you need to build a new string. And C++, using this version of string that we're using, this newer style string, it actually allows you to change the contents of it. It's, it used to be, in Java, it's read-only. In C++, it's not. It's read-write. Um, now, we might ask the question, and this, in a weird way, makes some sense. Our general view is that C++ is old. C++ is older than Java. But it's not like Java's been out for five minutes. Java came out in like the mid-90s. I mean, it's been out for a few minutes. So we might look at something like this and you say, you know what? I get it that maybe a lot of the time strings behave the way that, you know, in a very convenient way, but in this particular case, I kind of want to be able to directly change the string. It feels like something I should be able to do. Well, since we're looking at a new style string in C++, presumably, I think definitely, this string class came out after Java was out. So they had the opportunity in C++ to say, hey, look, we're inventing a new type. Old strings were, they, they really sucked, right? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't let us do anything to them. Um, they were just char arrays and, um, you know, solved a problem but didn't have a lot of conveniences for them. So we're inventing a brand new type called string. We can make that type whatever we want. So we can go and look at how strings work in Java and in C sharp and say, you know what? That guy's pretty decent, but we can, we can make some improvements on it. And one of the improvements they made is they made it read write. You can change the values at a particular element in a string because sometimes that's beneficial. Java won't let you do it. New style strings in C++ will because they're actually more recent than Java. So we have an older language with a newer feature that has fixed something that more modern languages don't have. Kind of an interesting uh, um, kind, of, kind of history sequence. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you, you, so he wants to do this. It's called a compound operator. We haven't looked at them yet, but you can. This right here is equivalent. It's literally identical to writing that. It's just shorthand. I usually call it syntactic sugar. Yeah, it's just shorthand makes makes your life, uh, let's say, a, a little bit less, a little bit less convenient, a little bit more convenient, possibly at the cost of being a little bit harder to read. Not that that is, but it's just a thing. Um, in general, as a general rule of thumb, and part of the reason why I am um, purposely writing this out, in fact, we'll talk about plus plus right now, is because I think there's value, especially for beginning programmers, to not take shortcuts. Write stuff out until you get so bored with it that you appreciate the shortcut. <laughs> and you don't view the shortcut as, oh, this is just the way. Um, I think there's value in it. You'll make less mistakes. All right, so um, let's look at this plus plus operator and the minus minus operator. How many of you uh, have been using plus plus and minus minus in your code? Okay, out of the people who have their hands up, is this something that you already knew? Or so if you already knew it, keep your hands up, put your hands down if you saw it in some example and just adopted it. 
All right, already knew it. So we're gonna keep an eye on these folks to see if they get the questions that we're gonna ask today right. See if they really knew what plus plus meant. All right, so, because this is the problem with that operator. So we have two operators, we have plus plus and we have minus minus. Minus minus. Pretend like those are very close to each other <laughs> because uh, Keynote is merging them together into one super line. Okay. So plus plus is the increment operator, which adds one to the value that it is associated. with minus minus uh, whatever is the decrement operator which subtracts one from the value that it is associated with dangling prepositions all over the place all right so let's look at this by example uh, I'm going to go ahead and let me, um, I'm going to give you this code in Slack just as some example stuff to, to look at when you're doing homework stuff, maybe. Since I'm about to delete some things. String concatenation and read write in C++, which is better than some newer languages. Throw that label on there. All right, so let's So we're going to say int a is equal to 5. C out a. What's the output of this program going to be? It's going to be 5. Okay? That one's not rocket science, right? Programs begin and end with main. What does main say to do? Even though I have all these functions prototyped and stuff, main doesn't say to use one of them. Main just says, look, remember a variable named A, set it equal to five and print it out. It's gonna give me five. Okay. So now, C out A plus plus. And L, what's the output of this gonna be? You think six? I only get, I'm only, oh, 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 I'm sorry. I just want to go that one. What's the output of that going to be? You think five? You think six? Six? Okay. It's going to be five. It won't error. All right. It's going to be five. But if I do a C out A after that, now I'll have my six. So there's my five, there's my six. Yeah, so we're getting there. All right. So <laughs> if we do plus plus a here, what's going to be output of this line? Output of that line is now six. Used to be five, but now it's six. What's the output of this line going to be? Still six. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show these guys right next to each other. So I'm gonna say int b is equal to five. And we're gonna do a c out b plus plus and l so we can see them right next to each other. In this case, I'm putting the plus plus before the a. In this case, I'm putting the plus plus after the B. The output of this line will be six. The output of this line will be five. But the output of both of these lines will be six. So we're gonna have a six, a five, and a six, six. There's our six, our five, and our six, six. So here's the punchline. In both of these cases, 
when we use the plus plus operator, the value that we are associated with did change. It went up by one. We proved it right here, right? They both changed. A was one bigger, B was one bigger. But in the moment, the position of the plus plus operator made a difference. When the plus plus operator comes before the A, we change the value first. We change it beforehand and then resolve to the new value. When the plus plus comes after, we resolve the value first, then change it. So in this case, A became a six, then we resolved A to its new value, which is six. In this case, we resolved B to a five, and then B became a six. Make some sense? So when you use the plus plus beforehand, the change is immediate, and then that new number becomes uh, 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 is stored inside of uh, uh, A, but we get the new number immediately. When it comes after, we change the value, well, we get the current value of B, that's what's available to us immediately. And then, because this happens after, so after we get the value of B, we change it. So the position of the plus plus does make a difference. Minus minus follows the same rules. All right. What about, let me just write another line here. Say C is equal to five. All right, so I have plus 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 C. What's the output of that guy going to be? Or if you really want your brain to explode, <laughs> how about that? How about that guy? <laughs> I got that guy right there. Plus plus C plus plus. All right, but I like this one better just from a let's talk through it thing because I'm a big advocate of letting your mind resolve the line of code before you come up with the solution. All right, so plus 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 C is something that we might do in or, or if, if you like using the plus plus afterwards, you could say C plus 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 plus. That's something we might do if we wanted to increase it by two, for example, right? That could happen. Sometimes we want it to go up by one, but there might be occasions where we want it to go up by two. So can't I just keep tacking on plus pluses to make it go up by two? The answer is no, but there's a reason why. It's not just C plus plus decided to be a jerk about it, okay? Plus plus C right there does change the value of C, correct? We've seen it. But what I have highlighted there, what does that resolve to? What does that turn into at runtime? Go ahead. Okay, which is what? No, I'm not tricking you. You've, you answered it correctly the first time around. Plus plus C gives me a what? Gives me a six. That guy is a six. So now what I've actually said there is I've tried to say plus plus six. Now this plus plus operator works with variables. This dude's in numeric literal. I'm trying to redefine what six means. I'm trying to add one to six and permanently change six to actually mean seven. Doesn't make sense, right? So it's not that C just arbitrarily made the decision that, oh, you can't string plus pluses together. It's that it doesn't make sense based on the way values are resolved. This isn't a special case. This is an always type thing. We need to resolve values. To, uh, we need to resolve code to the values they represent. Plus plus C here, we've already seen that changes the value of C immediately and then boils down to the new value of C, which is a six. But now we're further resolving this line and we're trying to say plus plus six, which is illegal code. That doesn't make sense. That's why the plus 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 thing doesn't work because variables aren't involved. Um, you probably could 
Uh, no, that won't work either. Yeah, I think we'd be stuck with this. You wouldn't be able to string them together. Now, you could do something like um, C plus equals two. If you wanted a little bit of a shorthand version of being able to say C equals C plus two. The bottom line is, if you want to use that shortcut, the plus plus and the minus minus, you do it in the context of, uh, um, uh, I just want to add one, or I just want to subtract one. Now, my encouragement to you is never rely, this kind of falls into that same category as always use the curly braces, okay? Never rely, even though it's consistent, we can rely on our knowledge of if the plus plus comes first, we do the change first, then get the new value. If the plus plus comes after, we get the old value and then we change it. Those are all truths and they'll always be truths. But I would encourage you never to rely on that. Never put this guy on a line by itself. If I say plus plus A here and then print out A, this is going to give me a six, correct? What if I say B plus plus and then I print out B? What's the output of this guy going to be? Also a six. It did not matter whether I said plus plus A or I said B plus plus. Made no difference because I did it on a line by itself. I said, any way you cut it, I want this variable to go up by one. But I'm not going to use that variable. I'm not going to use the trick to get the value of that variable immediately because I don't want to muddy the waters. Even if you understand it. Imagine somebody else is reading your code. It might be difficult for them to follow, or maybe they don't remember how it works. I mean, it's fairly self-explanatory, but it's one more thing that you have to think about that really has very little to do with logic, right? Nothing says you can't just never use the plus plus stuff and just say, look, I want A to go up by one. So I'm going to say A equals A plus one. It went up by one. Life goes on. You could just avoid the plus plus stuff for life. Okay, it's not cooler writing it and taking advantage of whether you put it beforehand or put it afterwards or anything like that. All right, but it is something that does work. My encouragement would be whenever you write a line of code, make sure you fully understand why it works the way it works. Because that's often more instructional than the fact that it does work. Understand why it works. Okay, so I like that substantially better than this line. Even though they both give me the same result. Make sense? It's not that one of them is wrong. I just think that this one is less error prone. All right, questions about the plus plus stuff? So now inside of a for loop, I can say I plus plus. And because I'm not directly using this value right then and there, it doesn't matter if I say I plus plus or if I say plus plus I, I'm getting a value that's one greater than I. This guy runs in and of itself. And then on the next line, we're asking a question about the new value of i. It didn't matter if i changed immediately or i changed afterwards. By the time I get here, i has changed. All right, make some sense? I would say that just in my personal practice, I'll always say i plus plus. That's just a nice, quick, a little bit shorter way of writing than i equals i plus one but I hardly ever will do a plus plus I or something. And it would only be in the context if I'm trying to write something every now and then you bump into one of those situations where you can write like a single fairly cool line with things like they're called inline if statements and things like that. Um, it's like, it might be worthwhile writing this in this particular scenario and then having knowledge of exactly how this stuff works is beneficial in this exact moment. But let's call that some fraction of 1% of the time that you might run into that. 
So I would say I might go many years in a row and never actually put a plus plus before the I, before I happen to bump into some sort of interesting thing where it might look cool on paper, All right? So I write it like that almost every single time, but I rarely, if ever, rely on what that value immediately boils down to. I almost always will put it on its own line so that it didn't matter whether you put it before or after. All right, that makes some sense? So that's the story with the, uh, the plus pluses and the minus minuses. Questions about that, where we introduce arrays. Okay. And I don't care if you use the plus plus or you just keep saying equals whatever plus one, doesn't matter, matter to me, whatever makes you most comfortable. All right, so let's go in here. Well, of course, of course it couldn't be. <laughs> I was just thinking it. I was just thinking it. All right. So, um, arrays. So, up until this point, so we're still talking about variable types here. So, up at this point, we've talked about primitive types. This is our byte, short, int, long. Uh, char, float, double, and Boolean. Okay, so these are things built into the language that can only hold a value. All right, those are our, our primitive types. They can hold a single value. Then we've introduced a single object type, even though we haven't started writing our own objects yet, but we've introduced a single object type called a string. And we've seen that strings can hold a value like hello, hello world, elephant, whatever. They can hold a value but they can do some extra stuff. A string can tell us its length, right? For example, okay? And they can do some other things. We've done some concatenation with it and stuff like that. But at the very least, strings can do more than just hold a value, okay? Now, we might say sometimes we might want to hold multiple values of a single type under a single variable name. Sometimes I want a collection of integers, or I want a collection of chars, which we used to call strings, um, or I want a collection of floats, okay? And in that particular situation, we want, we need to have the ability to define a variable capable of holding some number of something. So if I want a collection, um, so generic syntax is type followed by size. And this is var name equals that. So I have my variable name and it's gonna be equal to the type that I'm storing, followed by a square bracket, followed by the number of elements that are in it, followed by a closing square bracket. We're going to call this the convenient syntax. All right. Um, so we're going to call this generic inconvenient. syntax, and you might say, well, why would you ever want to do that? It explains a lot about how this is working under the hood, because we're going to spend next class talking about the details of how these guys work under the hood. All right, so in here, we would say something like var name is equal to type pointer malloc size times size of type. Both of these guys 
mean the same thing. Okay. Now, the important thing here isn't how scary this might look. It's that, of course, it's that this guy means the identical thing to this. And actually, this guy here is far more descriptive of what's actually happening under the hood. This tells us the story of how do arrays work. In fact, in C++, that's the convenient syntax. If we say generic Java syntax, it's actually um, type open square bracket bar name equals new type square bracket size. And this hasn't changed. So the reality is, as a C++ developer, or this existed in C as well, it's always been this way. Java, we would look at this and say, you know what? This maybe isn't as bad as this, but it seems to be less convenient than that. Yet Java is a lot newer. C sharp works the same way. C sharp, same thing as this. All right. So I'm going to, in our last minute here, I'll give you the highlight of what's happening. So arrays live in something called contiguous memory. That is memory that is right next to each other in our larger system memory. That is to say, if I want 10 integers, I'm going to need some memory big enough for holding 10 integers. Okay. And if an integer is four bytes big, 32 bits, it's four bytes big. That means if I want to hold 10 of them, I need 40 bytes of land. And what I'm saying is, is that the operating system is going to give me 40 bytes of land right next to each other. Right. And it's very important that it works that way. And strings work this way as well behind the scenes because of the way we index them. All right. So next time we're going to come back, we're going to talk about this concept of contiguous memory. We're going to demystify what this and this does, where this is going to be still geeky, cool looking, still scary looking, but I think it'll make a lot more sense. In Java, the new keyword is the same thing as this malloc. This is memory allocate, the new keyword. I usually refer to that as our real estate agent. It asks the operating system for some new memory. All right, um, continue to practice with um, our functions and stuff. I won't give you the homework assignment for Thursday, but I strongly encourage you to maybe come up with some of your own stuff, keep practicing with it. Remember the midterm is going to be uh, next week. On Thursday, we will spend some time going through the um, uh, the slides telling you, I'll tell you what's, um, kind of important, what's not important, that kind of stuff. The midterm will be online. Um, I'll put it up probably Monday morning and it will be due by uh, end of day Thursday or something. So you can choose when you want to take it, but we'll have normal class uh, classes uh, next week. Thursday, we probably won't have class because that's officially the day, actually Tuesday. Tuesday will be officially the day of the midterm. So you will have class time to take that test if you don't have any other availability time. So our last class before break will be this uh, this Thursday, okay? But your exam will be up uh, by beginning of day on Monday if you want to take it earlier, you want to take it later, but you'll have class time at the very least on Tuesday to do the exam. We'll talk about it in more detail on Thursday.